now. Aha, here we go. Welcome everyone to this safe space where we learn how to heal and treat and train and feed our dogs better. And today I have yet again the most wonderful Dr. Jones of Veterinary Secrets, who all his information will be linked down below, but a world-recognized veterinarian who has a lot of expertise in what we're going to talk about today in pet first aid, but as well as natural and more integrative holistic veterinary practices, which aligns with what we are passionate about. So welcome, Dr. Jones. Awesome. Thank, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me here, Rachel. And yeah, and I'm glad to talk about first aid. It's a little bit different. It's not something I talk about uh, as often. Yeah. I'm, I'm really excited because this is the video that if anybody's going to watch one of our videos, this probably should be the one simply because this is one of those that you, you don't know when you're going to need it. Uh, but when you do need it, it could really be life-saving because we're going to be talking about pet first aid, what to do in emergencies with our pets if for some reason we can't get to the emergency vet right away or we're unsure of if we should go to the emergency vet. So um, that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to talk about some common issues. You know, maybe your dog has a scratch or maybe they're having some loose stool or maybe they've eaten something you're not sure about. Uh, maybe they're choking, et cetera. And we're going to talk about uh, assessments. We're going to talk about what to look for and how to help our dogs and our pets in emergencies. So with that, Dr. Jones, let's just jump right into it. I know that this is going to be something that people are going to refer back to multiple times. So I'm excited about that. Um, I think, you know, you and I were talking about offline, one of the more important things you think about when our pet has what we believe to be an emergency, that one of the first things you, you do is the assessment. Can you talk a little bit about an assessment on our pet? Exactly. So the big basis of anything like knowing whether your dog is sick or not especially urgent or emergent is you know you just being able at home to like look at your dog and just check some basic things on your dog and get an idea like it is is this serious or not obviously there's there's big emergencies your dog's been hit by a car or she's excessively bleeding I mean that's pretty clear but this is more where you just come home and your dog doesn't seem quite right and you call her over and she's you know, heads down and you're not sure like did you just eat something did you eat something outside and you're not and and that's often in practice i would get this is when i would get calls on emergency it would be like my dog is not quite right and i'm not kind of sure like do i wait a few hours or do i wait the night and this is like where you as a pet parent can start just with the basic like being able to do just a basic exam of your dog at home where and what you always need to know you need to start now when your dog's healthy so you know what is normal so then you can say okay here what is abnormal um, so one of the things i always suggest is just like once i think it's a good idea just once a week you just do this brief exam of your dog and you have an idea okay here's what normal is so where should you start doing that well initially it's just you're standing back and you're just you look at your dog, like that's how we would do. We just ask, like, okay, here's how my dog visually looks. And maybe he's not moving quite as well. Okay, well, I know something's not quite right. Then, I mean, you're gonna, you would visibly look at, you know, how are they breathing? Uh, do they seem, does it seem pretty normal? How is it compared to how it normally is? And then after you've sort of looked at your dog and you from a distance, then you're going to be putting your hands on your dog and you're going to assess some of the sort of basic parameters. I know in practice, like the first thing we'd always do is the TVR. We, we see what's your dog's normal temperature, sort of like 10, for most dogs, it's sort of 101 to 102.5, 103. I'm in Canada, we're all, I hear I'm, I'm in <laughs> Celsius, I'm not in Fahrenheit, so I have to like convert back. Yeah. For us, it was 38 degrees Celsius, plus or minus a degree. That covers virtually every animal in the animal world. Um, but there's, so it's about 38.5 for a dog, which is about 101, 102.5. If your dog is sort of 103, sort of 103 and up, especially 103.5 and up, then we say that dog has a fever. Yeah. Um, and say, for instance, one of the things, um, if we're going to delve into one of the topics, like say, for instance, heat stroke. Um, actually, let me just go, with, let's just do a brief exam of your dog. Like how yeah. I do an exam first before we kind of digress onto different conditions. But that would be an initial thing I do. What is the norm? What's my dog's temperature? I thought he's hot. And 
as far as assessing your dog's pulse, like, so that's your dog's heart rate, is for a lot of people, like, the easiest way to find the pulse, there's a big artery inside the thigh called the, the femoral artery. But sometimes, where you can put your three fingers together, put it on the inside of your dog's thigh, you can put it across the inside of the thigh, and you can feel this vessel pulsating. But for some people, that's even difficult to do, and my dog doesn't have a pulse. And one of the things I said is just put your hand on the inside of your dog's left armpit over top of the lower part of the chest just to feel their heart beating. And or you just stick your ear right there. You're just trying to assess, like, okay, what is my dog's heart rate? So what is the normal heart rate? It really varies, obviously, based on the size of the dog. So the smaller a dog is, the, the more rapid their heart rate is. Yeah. Somewhere we've seen sort of 80 to 120, there's a range. Um, but some of the small dogs have are going to have faster heart rates. But that's an idea, once again, to you, nor what's your dog normal resting heart rate? So you're probably going to know that. And as far as breathing rate, it's not as... Uh, we're not as focused on that until it's abnormal. But nor normally your dog's probably taking a breath every three or four seconds if you watch them. Maybe you might watch in between, maybe it's in four or five seconds, but it's maybe sort of about 20 breaths a minute is kind of a normal range. Um, but often if you notice just that your dog normally at rest, you probably don't even think about it because they don't put a lot of effort into breathing. And it's when it's more labored and that's when you're going to recognize okay that's not normal so those are all things you know normal tpr and then one of the next big things i'm going to do is i'm just looking at especially the your the head of your dogs you're going to get so much information by looking at your dog's eyes you're going to lift up their eyelids look at the color around their eyes of the white tissue called the sclera you're going to lift up their lips you're going to look at their gum color which is a real big thing to assess in lots of different um, health conditions. Yeah. So when you lift up your dog's lips and you look at their gums, it should be a nice bright pink color for most dogs. And if you go to chow or something and he's got these black gums. Um, and one of the things you're going to look at there, healthy pink means he's got more than probably adequate blood supply. He's not in shock and or he's got normal blood volume. Um, let's say, for instance, a dog in shock or a dog who's bleeding internally, often you're going to lift up their lips and you're going to see those gums are pale, often a pale white. And those are all like big indicators. Like, okay, you know, when we would see a dog in practice and lots of different things can trigger shock. But an example is just a, an animal that's hit, a dog's been hit by a car and he's coming in and perhaps he's bleeding internally or, but there can be other conditions such as uh, complications from diabetes. Yeah. Right? Or you can have complicate or things called septicemia where you have infection circulating in the body. All those things can cause shock. But you're going to see the same sign. We see a dog that's breathing a bit heavier. So his respiration rates are much faster. Maybe they're one every two seconds, 60 breaths a minute. And we lift up his lips, look at his gums. They're a bit pale. Pupils might be a little bit wider. And his heart rate is typically higher. So then, okay then you know it's more serious. So, and those are things you can all assess. You can assess your dog's breathing rate. You can look at their gum color, get an, and you can get an idea, okay, this is more serious. And then after you've looked at their mouth, you've looked into their, you've looked at their gums or their mouth, you looked at their eyes, maybe you've looked at their nose, you assess the head. And then typically then I'm just using my hands, going through palpating the rest of your dog's body to try to find an area that may explain, is there something uncomfortable here? Does something not feel quite right? And you can do much that same thing where you're just briefly examining your dog while they're there and you're, does anything seem sore? And I'm sure many of you do that at home now, but if you don't, it's just a good idea to do, just to get comfortable with that basic exam. Yeah. I think what's really stands out to me is your tip to do this when your dog is healthy so you know what their baseline normal is. And one thing I, uh, one of my dogs has uh, blackish gums, a part of her gums. And I didn't really know, I mean, I knew that, but there was one time we were out walking and I was like, oh man, is she getting overheated? I, I get paranoid. And I'm looking at her gums and I was like, wait, is this normal? I can't remember because they, they didn't look like most dogs gums. Um, and it turns out that was her normal. So what I've done since then, which kind of aligns with what you're saying is I took a picture of her gums when they're normal of all my dogs. 
Um, mm-hmm. That way, if in the future I have concerns or if I need to show the vet, I can see kind of what her baseline normal gums are. Um, I did the same thing with my dog's eyes. You mentioned looking at their eyes just to kind mm-hmm. of see because in that moment of, oh no, like I'm up on the mountain, like should, should I be really worried? Do I need to carry them down? It was just kind of a good, I guess, baseline for me. So I like that you're suggesting to kind of get a feel for our dog's normal breathing rate, um, their what their gums look like, their tongue even, when they're healthy, mm-hmm. so that when we're concerned and you're maybe a little bit of an overbearing pet parent like myself, who's like so quick just to like go to the vet over every little thing and that adds up in cost, um, it's a good way to kind of look at it and go, okay, actually this is normal. We probably are okay. Let's, you know, let's continue an assessment. So I like that a lot. Good. That's good. And so have you had an example, Rachel? So for instance, you're in California where it's obviously hotter mm-hmm. and you're hiking in the mountain, you're hiking somewhere with your dog and the temperature is up. So you're able to look at them and say, okay, obviously the biggest concern is something like heat stroke. Yeah. Which I imagine is even more prevalent in California versus where I live. Yeah. So you're able to at least look at them and say, okay, I'm, I think my dog's not too hot. He's just, he's breathing heavy, which is what he's initially supposed to do to like, lower his body temperature. Yeah. Um, and, but have you ever had to have the experience of? Like, I, uh, I haven't, but one thing I learned, and I'd be curious to see your thoughts, is that one of the worst things, so we lived in Texas for a number of years. So it was really, um, aware of my dogs getting overheated because it doesn't cool down in, in the evenings like it does here. Um, and it gets very hot, obviously. And one thing I learned, and you know, I don't know if this is accurate, so I'll see your thoughts, is that one of the worst things we can do if we suspect heat stroke or if there is heat stroke is to just um, drench our dog's coat with water because it can act as like a sauna, that instead it's better to get water up on their groin and like in their mouth to cool them off is what I've learned and even on their paw pads because that helps with the evaporation of the water, that helps cool them down better than just like soaking their coat. But I'd be curious to your thoughts on that. Well, so the new, so the new thought is you're, you're definitely partially right. Is that you want, so first, I mean, the definition of a heat stroke, the body temperature rises above 103, you know, 104, if it gets up to something like 106, I mean, that's serious, mm-hmm. serious signs of heat stroke. And then what can happen in heat stroke is you're starting to all of a sudden the blood supply to all these external organs are shutting down. And what, because what the body is trying to do is rapidly cool off. And it's the, the last thing it's trying to do is make sure the brain keeps functioning. So it, you lose blood supply. So you get this whole cycle of organ damage. But while that's happening, I mean, I think most people are, are going to recognize unless something happens, like my dog is getting progress, progressively hotter. But say you, who knows, something happens, your dog got trapped in your garage or something, you come home. And there he is just excessively panting. And that's always the first big indicator. You're going to see this probably thick ropey saliva, which unfortunately I've seen more than a few times in practice. Mm. And then you add that into, you lift up the you may see these bright red gums. I mean, they're all classic signs of a dog that has heat stroke is yes, you definitely want to cool them down rapidly, but not too rapidly because that can cause another whole set of issues. Mm. So as you said, so one of the things is they don't wrap your dog in a big wet towel, like you said, or like, because that actually will warm up and act like a blanket, like you said. Okay. So then it is, you want to get stuff into their groin, the area where there's a big blood supply into their groins, their armpits, as you said, water in your gums and, you know, wrap the, get that cold pack in there, get that cold water in there, maybe partially immerse them, immerse them in cold water, but not, as you said, completely soak them with ice cold water everywhere um is is ideal like where you're you know control cooling them down um, as opposed to rapidly going from extreme heat to like this this huge shock and cause another whole set of uh, symptoms but yeah you're right about that and where i would have normally thought i mean you would think just throw them in just douse them in cold water or wrap them in something right you want to focus on their groins the armpits and do it in a little bit more of a control way. Yeah. And it's, and it can happen pretty quickly with some dogs, you know, depending on uh, the breed and I guess their conditioning. Um, and even, I mean, I know this is common sense, but I just have to say it like leaving your dogs in a hot car, you know, the cars can mm-hmm. heat up so quickly. So I just have to put that in there that that can happen um, 
and, and be Come fatal really, really quickly. So we definitely want to avoid <laughs> leaving dogs in cars that get, you know, overheated. Cause that, I think it's like anything, if it's over 70 degrees outside, it's probably too warm to leave our dog in a car, I think is what I read once. And always checking the cement when we're walking our dogs, when it's warmer to make sure it's not too hot, things like that. Mm-hmm. So um, I think that's important. So, okay. So we talked a little bit about heat stroke and I think that's a a uh, fairly potentially common, at least concern that a lot of pet parents have. So I think all of yeah. that is, is really helpful. And I think to prevent that, right, it's a matter of walking them in cool conditions, giving them shade, access to water. Even during the walk, I'll like to cool down their groin area, um, splash yeah, some water there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are there any other prevention tips that, that you've seen to really help? Well, one of the things you just brought up too is the some of the breeds are more prone. So if you've got a little brachycephalic dogs, mm. you've got a little pug or something. I mean, those are the guys that have the hardest time because they don't have, we we can sweat all over the place. So our dogs can sweat through their paws, the ends of their nose, and then just by panting. Like that's their only way they can cool themselves down. Yeah. So you've got some of those breeds at higher risk, especially with the pushed in bases and they just can't move as much air. So they're the guys who are at bigger risk. Then the rest of the common sense tips that you just said, right? As far as your, you know, your moderate exercise, avoiding the hot times of the day. And if you suspect something, because sometimes some of the thoughts are even for dogs to get heat stroke, it's maybe there's something else going on as well. Mm-hmm. So their body is trying to deal with another health condition, or maybe they're on some type of medication that affects the, their ability to just cool themselves. So then it's like you just being where okay, it doesn't seem quite right. Okay, maybe let's shorten the walk and or let's just right. Yeah. Get him into that water. Yes, um, for sure. Something into his groin and allow yeah. himself to be cool. Absolutely. Um and okay, so let's talk about one of the more common things I feel like people have str- I think every pet parent has struggled with oh no, my dog just ate something that maybe they shouldn't and or we suspect that they have. And I think this is something that especially puppy parents um, and really any dog owner, like we've, we've struggled with this, we've worried about this, we're constantly thinking about how can we keep our dogs from counter surfing and eating things they shouldn't. But let's talk about it from an emergency standpoint and talk about, okay, I've come home or I've had a cookout with friends and there's a lot of potentially dangerous foods. And I think my dog may have eaten a food item, let's say a darker chocolate or some grapes um, that's potentially toxic to them or is toxic to them. What do we do in that situation? Do we quickly rush them to the emergency vet? Actually, let me rephrase this. I also want to disclose in this video, we're not here to give any medical advice or treat or prescribe or cure or anything like that or diagnose. Um, So I'll rephrase that question to say, what would you do with your dog in that situation if you, you have a cookout and you think your dog has ingested something that they shouldn't have food wise? So for me, especially in practice, I mean, that that's probably one of the more common yeah. reasons, period, if you call an emergency or someone's trying to decide, do I come in or not? Yeah. So fortunately, like the big caveat for most dogs, they can eat most things and they're going to be fine. Most of the things our dogs can eat, believe it or not. So for instance, I just had a neighbor who called his dog actually ate a, he's a, he's a cross-country skier, ate some type of ski ski bandana his lab um, ate his bandana mm. completely fine i mean i'm i'm sure he said his banana was there and now it's gone like i think he ate it we're not sure but he's not 100 like, percent. so that would how i first initially assessed my dog in practice how is he clinically is he not vomiting he's not comfortable he's still walking around i give him some water he drinks the water he doesn't vomit that up mm-hmm. i give him a little bit of food he eats the food he doesn't vomit that up so the first assessment is just how does your and or your dog seem? And if that's the case, then that is telling me initially, okay, maybe he has eaten something, maybe he hasn't, maybe that's there in the stomach, but it's not obstructing anything. So then I'm like, okay. Then I think then in that situation, I'm much more comfortable saying, let's just wait and watch. Let's give him a day or two and you're going to watch your dog. So long as he continues to eat and he continues to drink and he's not vomiting, then and then I'm not, and he doesn't seem like he's in distress in any way, then I'm fine then to monitor those dogs. So the one tip I gave to my friend was he actually used 
just got gave him his his dog Vaseline. So to help pass it. Yeah. So we're just providing some additional lubrication. Yeah. And yeah. A few days later it came his little his bandana. Article of right of clothing. Yeah. And that is one of the safest things. And often we would do this in practice, or often I'd have clients and they just couldn't afford to come in. But some of it's not even just the issue of should they come in? It's they couldn't afford to come in. And that's Good one point. of the things. If you're going to watch your dog at home, you're going to make sure he's continuing eating and drinking. He still seems alert. He's not uncomfortable in any way. Maybe give him something to help speed it up. And typically Vaseline or something like, but all, often that's the reason I would do, often say Vaseline is you don't want an oil that's going to get absorbed. You want something that's going to lubricate whatever's there. And it's one of the things where it doesn't get absorbed in any way. It's generally pretty benign for animals and it'll help move whatever's in that stomach further through. Um, it also depends because Rachel, right, so you brought up, say the issue, did my dog eat grapes? But if you don't mm -hmm. know, like, there, the, the other big issue just general in emergency medicine is, is if you know what your dog has consumed and you have can get an approximate amount, that's so much beneficial for us, you know, obviously in the clinic, but secondarily, all that, you need to know, to know all that information. Whereas I think he ate this, maybe, maybe not. Um, then it, it often would come down to a judgment, um, but then it's, generally not advised to go ahead and start doing something like inducing vomiting if you don't know because right? yeah. you may cause an issue doing that and that was not necessary yeah i had um an issue a while ago years ago i had a dog that counter surfed and we had a huge ball of dough rising and right. he swallowed it whole i mean it was huge and i was like oh that's not good um, and so I had a vet friend, I was like, what do I do? He's like, just in, do the hydrogen peroxide, get him to vomit it up. And after, I think it was like three teaspoons, it was a whoop, came right up his hole. And that was one of those situations where I was like, oh my gosh, like that could have been really bad. Cause I imagine it could expand and, uh, the dog wasn't huge either. So um, pro tip out there, uh, if you're going to be making dough, like don't leave it to where the dog can get to it in any way, shape or form. Um, cause that could have been, you know, really, really bad. But yeah, I have heard that as well, that just giving the hydrogen peroxide to get them or to induce vomiting, for example, could be dangerous if we don't know that there's anything ingested. Um, so I've definitely heard that before. But then what you did in that situation, that's ideal. So for instance, that, and then backing up in a different situation is you know someone who's and i'd often get that on on emergency calls like someone's dog if you've seen their dog their small little dog eat a substantial sized dark chocolate bar mm. uh, and for instance in chocolate toxicity because there is a range of you know, because i've done a, diff, a number of different especially emergency videos and i'll have some people say i i fed my dog grapes my whole life and there's never been an issue or my dog eats chocolate all the time and he's fine. Um, but for all those different poisonings, you know, such as chocolate or grapes or even sugar, sugar free gum, such as xylitol, I mean, I, I've seen toxicities in all of those. So those are all real things. Mm -hmm. um, but say for the example of a dog who's eaten, a small dog who's eaten, I could give the example of eating, say, a, a half of a dark chocolate bar. That's enough, say, a I'm all measured in grams. So it would be say approximately a hundred grams, which mm -hmm. is about a, about a half of a kind of moderate sized chocolate bar. That would be enough to cause some potentially serious clinical signs to a small, a uh, small dog, say a 10 pound dog. Mm -hmm. So, and if you saw that and you're a substantial distance from a veterinary practice, it's much safer then. And I advise lots of different people on emergency to go ahead and induce vomiting in that situation. That's when you would do, or you saw a number of grapes being consumed and you've got a small dog because there definitely seems to be a likely correlation with the amount and the size of the animals. Then I'd say inducing vomiting. And one of the, I think I see your dog at the back, right? Yeah, kind of that's my senior. Um, <laughs> that's awesome. um, so that's one of the big things to have in a pet first day kit, just to have hydrogen, 3% standard, 3% hydrogen peroxide on hand. Yeah. It's just we, a good idea. I think everybody should have that. 
I, yeah. And one thing the vet told me um, is that he was like, some dogs, you know, need a little bit more than others. And he said, once you give it to him, you could kind of push up a little bit gently on his belly to kind of like get it to almost maybe, foam up yeah. to make them. <laughs> um, yeah. I didn't even get a chance to do that because it came right back out. But this dog here, when he was, he's turning 14 this year, but when he was probably two, jumped, my mom was visiting and he jumped up on the dining table and she had huge pile of chocolate toffee candy huge pile of it. And he ate the whole thing. I just couldn't, oh. and, but he was fine. I mean, he had loose stool for a number of days and it could have been really dangerous, but yeah. it's kind of one of those. Um, I think a lot of us have stories where our dogs have eaten you know, socks and things and they end up being fine, but it is important to be aware and to, uh, to you know, a, a advise with a consult with a vet mm -hmm. because it could just be that one time where, you know, something bad, it, they don't, to fare well with that. So I think that's important. And I, I, the hydrogen peroxide thing I know is, um, like you said, important to have in the house so that there, it is a tool. Cause you make a good point. Not everyone at the moment when something happens to their pet can afford to, mm -hmm. they know that going to that vet's going to be, you know, it's probably several hundred dollars or they on, on emerge. I don't know what yeah. it's like in California, but I know in some of the areas here, it's, you need to come in with a minimum deposit of $500 just to go in and Oh wow! Just go to the emergency. Some of the some of these wow. select emergency clinics. Yeah. Never mind. You know, then get your animal assessed and treated. So, I mean, some people just don't have that. You need to be able to have some. And, and even in those situations, I think the emerge clinics would offer a few suggestions, like go to the drugstore, get hydrogen peroxide, yeah. induce vomiting, and sort of the typical amount. There's a range, but sort of the standard amount that we used to advise in practices, one teaspoon per 10 pounds of body weight, you give one teaspoon, say for a five pound, a 10 pound dog. So a teaspoon, which is in milliliters, it's five mils. And if they didn't vomit within 10 minutes, you repeat that. And you're not diluting, you're giving it straight. I know now poison control, they've even updated some, some of their uh, suggestions or they're even in some cases suggesting doubling of those doses. Wow. Um, but in, in that was sort of my standard amount, one teaspoon per 10 pounds um, for dogs and even and or cats. And there's it, it's one of the only things that you're going to be able to have at home to be able to be to really safely induce vomiting uh, in a dog. And you never want to use something like salt because that can cause actually its own, you yeah, actually cause your dog to get seriously clinical sick called oh, salt, wow. salt toxicity. So we used to talk about using salt, don't use that anymore. Okay. One thing now, I'm not going to vouch for this in the accuracy, but I am, because I was curious, I am part of this. There's a couple Facebook groups. I don't know the name, but you can search them where they have, I forget the term, but there's these people that are special, like botanists, like they know plants. Yeah. And the entire purpose of these Facebook groups are to help identify, it's both for children and pets really that if you like, Oh, looks like my, my dog was on a hike and ate this plant. People will take that's a picture good. of the plant and send it in. Like, should I be concerned? And people will come on and verify. So that's another potential resource for those people, especially out in the woods, um, mm -hmm. might just explore as a potential option because there's people in those groups that are like, look, like I, I can't afford to go to the vet. Like, does this look like super serious? And people will come on and say, no, that's, you know, I don't know catnip or something, mm -hmm. something basic. So I thought that was a cool resource for emergencies. Um, now, before we talk, I do want to talk a little bit about choking, CPR, um, and, you know, my dog is having loose stool and diarrhea, but I want to ask you uh, your thoughts on two ingredients that are commonly um, thought of as toxic, which may or may not be based on your thoughts, because I don't know, but um, they are garlic and avocado. What are your thoughts on those for dogs? Gar great. I get lots of questions on garlic <laughs> and avocado. <laughs> yes. Wow. When we talked about ingredient or foods, I was like, ooh, we need to talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So <laughs> there aren't, so if anybody is to eat enough of many, many things, so people and or animals eat enough of something potentially toxic. So if you eat a thousand, however, I'm not, if you eat an excess, excess amount of garlic, you can definitely make yourself sick. Likewise, can your dog. Um, but if you look at all the, any of the clinical studies that have been done versus been virtually none done with garlic and dogs, 
that if a dog is given an appropriate dose of garlic, which could equate to as small as a quarter of a clove or 10 pounds of body weight, mm -hmm. you're not going to see any serious clinical signs. And in fact, there can be an array of different health benefits from doing that as has being a great antibacterial. It's also got some pretty important antifungal properties. It's being used, say for instance, it's being used in people for Lyme disease. So it's got an array of benefits. It's all relating to dose. And that's true with so many things. For instance, we look at say, some of these essential oils. If they're diluted to an appropriate dose, it, there's a difference to have 100%, um, say, lavender essential oil versus 2%. And even animal poison control says if you're applying these essential oils at 2% or less, they're generally considered safe because you're diluting them down. So as the example of garlic, and I actually advocate and I've used it and used it for different things and maybe use it give it to my dog as a natural antibacterial, it's about the dose. So, you know, a appropriate dose, a quarter of a clove for 10 pounds of body weight once or twice daily, never seen a, a problem. And I had many clients in practice that were using garlic. And I don't think, what, I know once, I never once treated an animal that had so-called like garlic toxicity. The issue is if you give enough, a hot, these extremely high doses, Yes, it can affect the red blood cells and cause a type of anemia, but you need to give a lot. Likewise, with with onions can cause, I mean, they're very much related in the plant world, but if you give enough onions, definitely that can cause a type of uh, hemolytic anemia, but you need to give an excessive amount. And I, even my dog, my friend's dog, who is a lab, who's been on a bunch of my videos, Pippi, I mean, mm -hmm. she won't eat onions, right? She'll eat everything else. She's quite fond of chicken food, but she won't eat onions. <laughs> yeah. Right. So that's part of the issue is the amount. Um, right. the, your second question was avocado. So if they eat, so the toxic, if they're toxic parts of the avocado would be the skin and or whether a dog could crack the seed open and the seed, right? She right. has cyanide in the seed. And then I think the name of the toxic component of avocado is persin. Uh, but that's within, that's in, the peeling of the avocado, yeah. not the actual flush of the avocado. The flush itself is actually quite healthy, right? It's a new, it is fairly fatty. You're not going to give your dog 10 of those. Like you may have stomach upset and might trigger pancreatitis, but yeah, it's got some pretty, I mean, it's a really healthy uh, nutrient to add in. But once again, it's right, what you're giving and you're giving the appropriate amount. Yeah, absolutely. And everything I've researched and learned and, you know, I, I, do a lot of these vet chats, they all agree with the same. And it, what's interesting about the garlic is it's, I did a video on it and it just got a lot of, you can't, you know, why are you yeah. promoting that? And what's interesting is some of the more popular kibbles um, that a lot of these people, you know, will feed their dogs have garlic oil, they do have garlic in them. Garlic yes. in them. I mean, there's a myriad of pet products mm that have garlic in them already. So I find it interesting. So it's, you know, I, I understand because there have been uh, concerns with them in the past, but they have been disputed multiple times uh, and have been used with animals multiple times. So it's one of the, what I tell people is if you're not comfortable feeding it, you don't have to feed it, period. Right, exactly. You know, it, it, yeah. it, that's up to you. But I just, for me, it's all about making decisions that are informed, not just based on like fear or mis misinformation, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So anyways, thank you for, yeah. Yeah. And the other thing was like average as, as part of that same, what you're just saying is you could give, give the example of the, the anti-inflammatory drugs, the NSAIDs, mm -hmm. I mean, you can go to the FDA website and I mean, they're probably one of the, you know, if you look at veteran medications, they are responsible for like thousands and thousands and thousands of like quite serious side effects. And often they're now just dispensed like routinely, right? Or just, there's some level of discomfort, or even these animals that have had surgery and that are going home with like a non scriptal anti-inflammatory drug, be it Rimdil or Madicam or something like that. And maybe they're borderline dehydrated, they're a little bit older, they've been in surgery, maybe their kidney function was slightly compromised. Like they're potentially really high risk of side effects. But often I see, we go home with those because they're scripted out and no one thinks a whole lot about that. And there's very little discussion yet. Right. If you mention, as you just talked about, you know, using garlic in another situation, how 
there's so there is a all right there's a bunch of different a lot of different medical information that isn't necessarily where you really do need to filter it and maybe put it all in context. And so right. it's just important that you're on this and you're watching this live stream and you're informing yourself to, you know, better treat your dog in the first place and know, okay, maybe I could try this. Maybe I don't need to use this. Yeah. And I think, um, and, and following pages like yours on YouTube and Instagram and TikTok, you're everywhere and you have a website is really important because you are literally going against the grain uh, in veterinary medicine and sharing um, sharing information that's really accessible and actionable for pet parents to treat and heal and take care of their dogs in a more natural, integrative, holistic way, which is really awesome. Um, so let's talk about the scary, my dog is choking, the ball gets stuck in their throat. I've seen a video go viral recently where a ball was kind of stuck right here, or maybe even I need to give my dog uh, CPR. Can you talk a little bit about how we could initially handle that situation, assuming we can't like rush to the emergency vet right away? Because of course that would be step one. Sure. And that would be step one. But part of the issue is just isn't the time. And even like one of the first emergencies I saw in practice or pretty early on was like someone had like a mid-sized sort of reddish brown ball that they were throwing I don't know, and a mid-sized lab and it was lodged exactly in that way further down and the, unfortunately by the time the dog got to the practice he had, um, he had stopped breathing and you know that was sort of my first exposure like holy cow like choking can happen pretty quick yeah. And if you don't know like some basic emergency skills, like that would have been the difference for potentially that dog living or not would be, okay, can you actually do, can you do CPR and or the Heimlich to help save your dog? Mm. And that's one of the things for many cases, like there just wouldn't be the time, like your dog as well. And I've seen many a different animal dog come in who's been choking on something, but if you hadn't, didn't have the ability to do some type of basic CPR, especially the Heimlich, your dog potentially wouldn't live. And even if you take it, if you actually look in, pra in veterinary practice, even if a dog is in cardiac arrest, so I know maybe med um, we have the idea, say, in human medicine that you can watch Grey's Anatomy. It seems like they're saving people all the time. But in, even in the practice, even if a dog is in cardiac arrest, even if, and we have all those, all that equipment there, where we can put a tube down the dog's throat so we can intubate them and we can get them on oxygen, and we can start them on IV fluids and we can start them on uh, epinephrine and some of the other cardiac drugs, even then they might have less than 5% chance of living. Yeah. So it's a, like, it really is challenging veterinary wise, but if you were to see your dog starting to choke, if you can do a Heimlich or some type of Heimlich procedure, mm -hmm. and I've had lots of different people comment on some of the different, some of the different videos saying that really did make a difference. So example first would be, so you think your dog's choking, you just have to assess, like most of the time you're gonna know you threw a ball, your dog jumped, swallowed it, and all of a sudden, like you can see, he's got him, he's having real difficulty in getting air in, like his mouth is open and his lips are flaring and he just can't get enough oxygen. And I think for many people initially, it's okay, you're gonna recognize that. Yeah. And obviously the, the next big thing is, if this has gone on for a period of time, you come in and you see your dog not responsive, there is basic CPR steps you need to go through. Like you need to first just assess your dog. You need to see are, are, are they breathing or not? Is their heart beating or not? Mm -hmm. And then you start going on CPR. But let's just talk, say, for instance, you throw in a ball and all of a sudden your dog's got difficulty. You start to see this breathing difficulty and you it's clear, okay, there's a ball lodged there. So the first thing is you want to open your dog's mouth without getting bit. And ideally, you want to try see if you can get your hand towards the back of their mouth and try to sweep that object out first, if you can. Like, that's the ideal thing first, right? Can I get in there and sweep it out? But if it's sort of a saliva-covered ball and it's sort of lodged at the back of their throat, in many cases, you can't. So the next couple things to consider do, there's a couple different techniques. The one that I've taught and want to even use in practice, it's, it's called the Heimlich. And I preferred, unless we have these for the larger dogs, I prefer to lift these dogs up. And so I lift where I have their head hanging down. 
Mm -hmm. And I've got their head, their back against my belly. And I've got my arms kind of wrapped up underneath their stomach. And I'm with their head hanging down, you know, their back up against me, their tails kind of hang over one side of my shoulder. I'm giving like five firm compressions just underneath their rib cage, sort of up and in. Because what you're trying to do is put pressure on their diaphragm, which is the area that separates their stomach from their chest. And that's going to put force up on, right? And that's going to put force down onto the their chest, down into whatever that object in the back of the throat. Because we're trying to force it down. We're trying to put air, we're trying to force that that object out of their throat. So, And we're using gravity because their head is hanging down. Right. To force that out of their mouth. And many people have used that. I mean, that's probably much easier to explain it and see it in a video. And I've got different images where I yeah. did, did it with my one sort of first dog. Uh, his name is Lewis, which I used in practice, which I used on YouTube videos. And even in, so he's a fair sized lab. If you've got a slightly bigger dog that you can't pick him up, um, then they just talk about doing it. It's like where your dog is still able to stand. Uh, they talk about doing it in a standing position. So it's okay. the same idea where you're hooking your hands underneath your dog's stomach and you're making these five com firm compressions underneath their sort of abdomen up towards their chest. And then after you've done five compressions, then you're going to put your, your checking to see is the object come out and or is your dog you know can you get any air um into your dog's nose into his lungs where you're putting your hand over his muzzle and you're blowing in through his nose to see if you can actually see his chest rise because sometimes it's not obviously clear like why are they not why are they choking maybe you don't know what's there right so that's part of the reason have you have you opened up the airway and then oh go ahead so it's harder to explain it with me without having. Yeah, <laughs> I'm definitely going to go back and, and um, reference your other YouTube videos on yeah. it. But it sounds kind of similar to what you would do to a human or even a child in a sense um, and kind of like thrusting it up to kind of get it to come out of their yeah. of their throat. Yeah. And then let's say that happens and let's say they're, you know, you see the ball pop out, for example, and but they're not breathing. Is that when I would do CPR? You would because you need. And then you would be following it up with CPR exactly, where you're you're lying your dog down on the right hand side, okay. and then you're going to locate their heart, which is located between the third and sixth rib spaces. So it's just underneath the left armpit. So you pull the left arm forward. You're going to put one hand on top of the other hand, and that's going over top of the chest. Mm -hmm. And in general, based on the size of the dog, so they say for a small dog, you're compressing the chest about a half an inch. Okay. A large dog, an inch, an inch upwards up, let's say upwards up two inches and say a big Great Dane or something. Right. So you're putting substantial force on the chest wall that's going to compress the heart. And now, now the thought for CPR is you're doing it quite quick. So you're doing two beats a second. And, and the other new sort of changes in CPR are, we used to say, do chest compressions for 15 seconds and then do two rescue breaths. Now they're saying at least, at least do, do it. For, you're going to do it for 30 seconds. So you're, you're going to do say a hundred, you're going to do one, two, you're going to do it for 60 compressions. And then you're going to do two rescue breaths where you breathe into the nose and breathe two times and then continue that way. Cause what they're finding is more important to do the chest compressions. And every time you do compress the chest and compress the heart, okay. you're, you actually are drawing a bit of air into the airway. And I think even now people are even advising to just do chest compressions and not even do rescue breathing. Yeah. As to being slightly more successful. Um, but yeah, as you said, the principles are much the same as in people if anyone's done any CPR. Um, but it is, is yeah. Is slightly it, different. Is, yeah. Sorry, is it similar to where you might like, like when you're doing the pressure, especially in the larger dog, what well, even the smaller dogs, I guess, that it might break some ribs, like, because with yeah. humans, I know that's okay. Yeah, exactly. Because you need to compress the chest enough. But that's yeah. something even, we weren't even taught that in veterinary school. Oh, okay. We were not taught CPR. We were taught how, here's how you're going to get the IV in, and here's how you're going to get them intubated, here's how you're going to get an oxygen, here's how you're going to get medication, right, kind of just stimulate the heart, such as epinephrine, some of the other drugs that would mm -hmm. increase blood pressure, the vasopressors. Um, but beyond that, no, 
just whereas say something like the Heimlich or being able because that's probably the most common reason I would generally see a dog that's going to go into cardiac arrest is they're choking it's more than anything that's the biggest thing so if you can deal with the choking eventually you can prevent them from then going into the level of of their heart stopping mm -hmm. and or just you know learning that basic CPR right, would be very beneficial and, and I think part of their issue why it's even so difficult in the clinic is by the time we're often seeing a dog it's it's been a long period of time yeah right? and breathing and heart not beating yeah and that's why it's so important to like you said earlier in this to find where your dog's heart beat is now so that when this come happens and you're kind of in a panic, you kind of know to put them on the right side and where to orient where the heart is. Um, you can look at their gums, et cetera. So I think that's really valuable. And Renee in the chat said that when she plays fetch, she only uses a breathe right ball, which those are the balls that have like holes in them. So I think that's, that's good. Yeah. 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 Wow. So that's yeah. good preventative. And what I've always done, cause I have um, a poodle, he's mostly poodle and he has a really Bit wide, long mouth. So, I've always, and he's very ball obsessed. So, we actually don't do a ton of fetch anymore because he just gets too intense. Okay. But when I did, or if I do it every once in a while, I get a larger ball than I think he would need. That way, if he does go after it intensely, it's yeah. like he can't, he can't go back in his in his throat. Um, but I love the breathe right balls as well that have like, like she said, the holes in them, so that if it does get lodged, they can breathe. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, that's a great idea. Because yeah. often it's like the tennis ball is even there's an idea ball, it's a tennis ball, but it's also about the size of a ball that could yeah. really lodge in the airway. The one other thing I also wanted to mention, there is this now new technique called the external extraction technique, okay. where you actually specifically get a ball, especially a round, smooth ball lodged in the back of the throat. And you can feel the ball. And that involves putting these dogs on their back. Okay. So they're lying on their back and you actually form an angle where you one your two your index fingers are attached to the base of the skull like this and your thumbs are anchored behind this ball where you're going to palpate it right behind the trachea because often that's where it's anchored and they'll actually make this motion where you actually go here and you push on top of the ball trying to push it out and i know yeah i've had more than enough because after 20 years of practice, especially a small town, you see a lot of emergencies because we all we did all our own emergencies as well. There wasn't an emergency practice. Um, but another uh, another uh, client had a dog with a ball exactly like that. And even when we had specific forceps in the clinic, we were not able to get the ball out. So that would be a way where you'd want to try like this technique where you're yeah. actually right? Their dog's in their back and you're anchoring your thumbs behind the ball and you're pushing it out of the throat. Because oh. often it's, especially a, a, a fair sized ball is, and that's exactly where it's stuck, right there in the area of the larynx. Oh. And you can actually, you'll see it right in there behind their jaw and you can anchor your fingers on it and push it out. Once again, I, I mean, it's hard to practice that on anything, but at the very least, just being aware of, here's my dog's larynx is. <laughs> basic joys i think here is about where i could push a ball out it's just a good thing to have in mind and maybe yeah. think about and preventative right like not exactly. um yeah um and then one more i know we're getting close to time but one thing i do see a lot of people talk about is like their dog gets a little uh tear on their paw pad or they get a little cut i've done this once i'll just admit it i was um when i was first learning to groom my doodle um i cut him a little bit and my first thought was like, oh my gosh, do I rush to get him, you know, stitches? What do I do, et cetera? Um, so what are some just basic tips you have of, of assessing our dog when we cut them a little bit or they have like maybe a tear on their paw pad? So first areas like the paws, the ear tips, they bleed a lot. So often they look quite dramatic, but they're not, or even just if anyone's cut a nail too short. Oh yeah. It, yeah, it's pretty impressive. The amount of blood that looks like a lot of blood. Fortunately, it's generally... It looks much worse than it is. Right. Um, so obviously the first big principle with anything is you're applying pressure right? and your gauze or whatever you have to put on that and wherever the bleeding is. And the next thing is always suggested is you don't take that gauze off. You would apply 
another piece of gauze on top or if it's a piece of cloth, whatever you have first. Mm -hmm. So it's pressure and you're reapplying more stuff on top. Um, one of the things I'd always suggest even in the first aid kits to have is just a little bit of tissue glue. And actually we would often in clinic, we just actually use crazy glue. Hmm. And a small wound, for instance, like say a, a, a pad cut, for instance, or say that an ear tip has been, say dogs, like that he's torn his ear tip. Yeah. Often that's actually, we would just glue it initially. Hmm. And it actually surprisingly worked pretty well. And maybe this, this is, especially you're in an, an emergency situation or you can't get in, but right. often that actually worked quite well. Um, and it's in generally safe for all guys. Yeah, I've seen... Um... I saw this actually in the pet store. They had a, so for, it's like a pet antibacterial spray glue, basically. It was like, hmm. um, have you ever seen, it's called like new, for humans, like new skin. It's like a yeah, band-aid yeah. that you spray on. Yeah. It's that, but for dogs, I don't, I don't know the ingredients per se, but I thought that looked really interesting. Cause it said like, oh, you have a, like a minor cut laceration. You could spray it on and it would help kind of keep it closed a little, like glue basically, but it hmm. had, I, something antibacterial in it. So mm. I thought that was interesting. So same concept as what you're kind of suggesting there. Yeah, it's actually good. It's, it's a good, uh, that's another just good thing to have as part of your first aid kit for sure. Yeah. Awesome. Well, this is fantastic. I know we're at time. I can't, like I said, when we first started this, I think this is such a valuable video because coming into this, I was like, oh, this would be great for us to learn. But you made such a great point that not everyone is going to be even be able to get to a vet um, or they maybe can't afford it. So it's like, here's something that you can maybe try uh, with your dog, like maybe on the way to the vet. So I think this is really helpful and I'm really grateful for everything that you you've shared here. There've been a lot of positive comments. Oh, good. Oh, nice. Yeah, absolutely. So with that, um, for everyone watching, please make sure you subscribe and you share this. Um, follow along Dr. Jones at his YouTube, Veterinary Secrets, or Instagram, TikTok, Facebook. I know you're everywhere, which is awesome. And I'm really just honored to have you here because I think that you are uh, an incredibly valuable resource for pet parents. You share so much information, all free, but you also have a website where you have, I believe, a book and a lot of really cool supplements and products. So really cool stuff that people can um, find out when they follow you and go to your website. Awesome.